So thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm thrilled that, that all of you are here today and that uh, you're, you'd like to spend your Sunday afternoon with us here at the National Library. And I, think, I thank uh, Mrs. Wayin Pryke for inviting me to speak. She's the director of the National Library. And she also gave me this topic, <laughs> future readiness, uh, which I've interpreted um, at the individual level, I mean, like, how can we Singaporeans become future ready? So I'm, I'm not going to talk about uh, what the government must do or what policies need to, need to change. I'd like to address it in terms of how each of us could think about the future and get more ready for it. Uh, so be, um, as a start, I'd like to get you to think about when you think about the future, can I ask you, how does it make you feel? Okay, so how many of you feel good about the future right now? Come on, okay, wow, brave souls. Yes, yes, more, more. Okay, so, so how many feel bad about the future or nervous? Okay. Okay, so, so it's about half, half, a lot of people haven't put up their hands, so I guess you're still deciding. Um, so, so my plan is that uh, for, for today's session is to look at, you know, some of the things that might be making us feel a little uncertain or fearful uh, about the future, and then work our way towards feeling more positive. So that's the plan, and I hope it works. And if not, you can ask why in for your money back. <laughs> okay, so this is a poem by a poet called Rilke. And uh, so if you're feeling scared uh, about the future, I don't know if his poem sort of uh, summarizes that. He says that the future is time's excuse to frighten us. Too vast a project too vast a morsel for the heart's mouth. I can't understand the second stanza, so I'm not going to read it. Yeah, but <laughs> I thought the first stanza, you know, kind of set the mood about uh, being uh, somewhat fearful. So, I don't know what you're thinking about when you, you think about being nervous about the future, but uh, for me, I think jobs is a big thing jobs and also what implications that has for education. And in April this year, this man, uh, most of you would recognize him, right, as Jack Ma. He's the, he's the man who founded Alibaba, which is the biggest e-commerce player in the world today. And he said at this entrepreneurship conference in, in China that in the next 30 years, the world will see much more pain than happiness due to job disruptions caused by the internet. And then he went on to say that machines should only do what humans cannot. Only in this way can we have the opportunities to keep machines as partners rather than as replacements of humans. So he's, he's worried about the future, obviously. And the irony is that, of course, you know, um, E-commerce is, is one of the biggest causes of job disruption. So I don't have figures for China, but uh, in America, for example, you know, department stores now employ a third fewer people than they did in 2001. So that's half a million jobs gone over 15 to 16 years. And then later on, I'm going to talk about myself because I work in newspapers, which are also being disrupted in a big way by the internet. And, um, you know, if you look at America, so you've seen like thousands of journalists thrown out of their jobs. And the uh, New York Times has recently announced this week, you know, buyouts for their editors and how they're restructuring their newsroom as well. So as for us in Singapore, um, some data from MOM, we know that in the first quarter of this year, we have some 74,400 people uh, jobless and most of them are Singapore citizens. And so, so what are some of the trends that we are seeing? We are seeing that employment in manufacturing, for example, has been falling for 10 consecutive quarters. That's like two and a half years. And um, so this is a big engine of our economy, right? It used to provide quite a lot of jobs and 
From end 2014 to this year, the manufacturing sector has lost something like 43,300 jobs. And it's, I mean, it's unlikely that the manufacturing sector will ever employ the same number of people as it did in the past because of you know, automation, technology, and AI, which I'm going to talk about. So, um, and then this week, I don't know if you guys read the, the Straits Times uh, report that we see that wage growth has also slowed. So last year, for example, fewer workers had salary increases and more people took pay cuts. So all, the, all this data is, is pretty scary. I mean, for someone, I, I'm assuming you are like me, we grew up in like full employment Singapore and sort of take it for granted that every year my pay is kind of going to go up. And um, so is that changing, I guess, is the question. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about automation, I mean, what, what kind of jobs are being automated, right? All these talk about robots. So there's a think tank called the McKinsey Global Institute, and they looked at the kinds of jobs that they think at current, um, with current technology, what could be automated, and they listed three types. So the first type is like physical activity or operating machinery. So I guess th those would be the factory jobs in which, for example, in Singapore, you've already seen us losing those kinds of jobs, right? Physical activity or operating machinery in a predictable environment. Then the second type is collecting of data, and the third type is processing of data. Okay, so those are the most likely to be automated. And, um, okay, do, do you guys know who this man is? I, I, mean, I have uh, his name down there. He has a Singaporean mother, by the way. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, I want to talk about artificial intelligence, and I put this man's face up here on the slide because, because of something called AlphaGo. AlphaGo might be more familiar to you, right? So that's the, the artificial intelligence program that has been beating all these world champions at Go. This, game that's supposed to be the most complex in the world and that you need strategic thinking and intuition in order to play it well and to win. So his name is, uh, I think his name is Demis Hasabis and uh, that's because his, his mother is Singaporean and his father is Greek Cypriot, but he's always lived, he was born in, and he has always lived in London. Uh, so he co-founded this company called DeepMind and they are doing really cutting edge research in artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is different, I, I, I think, la, uh, how I think about it, from the ordinary kind of technology that automates, um, that does the work that is sort of like manual. Because artificial intelligence has reached a stage such that machines are able to learn on their own. So basically, the, this guy and his team, they are working on AI programs that mimic the way our brains work. So you feed them lots of data and they can actually see the patterns and they can learn. That's how AlphaGo learned to play the game Go. Yeah. So the question is, is the future about us being replaced by machines? And then what happens to all of us? And um, I think that not necessarily the future, uh, that's, that's the future that we are looking ahead to, but certainly, I mean, given the trends, what, what do we have to do to adapt and how can we get ready for the future? So that's, that's what I want to talk about now. So using myself as an example, right? Um, sorry. Okay, this, this, uh, this is just a picture of me when I was a somewhat younger journalist, and, and it's the cover of a book that we worked on. But uh, so, so taking myself as an example, I've been a journalist all my life. That's the only job I know. And uh, the other three people on this book who are my colleagues, they've all left the Straits Times and moved on to other jobs, so I'm the only one left. And uh, when we talk about what's happening to Disrupt, we're talking about disruption due to the internet. I mean, one example is what's happening to newspapers. So, 
The Straits Times, for example, used to make a lot of money, okay, and, uh, and we still make money, we are still profitable, but we are making much less than we used to, and this is because we are, our business is being disrupted in a very big way by the internet. So the advertising revenue, most of our money comes from advertising, has moved from print to digital, and actually the bulk of the digital money is going to only two companies, two very big companies, Facebook and Google, okay? And then, uh, as you would know also, your reading habits have changed, right? So fewer and fewer of you, I think, would find the need to like, look at a hard copy newspaper every single day. Many of us are reading news on our smartphones, and many of us get our news for free, and we no longer feel the need to pay for news um, and fewer and fewer, fewer people we, we think will be subscribing suddenly to the print copy of the Straits Times and we are help, hoping to get our digital subscriptions up to make up for that. So what career advice would you give me? Should I, <laughs> I mean, should I stay in the Straits Times? I mean, what, 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 how can I get future ready? I don't know if you, any of you find yourselves in the same situation as me uh, in an industry that's being disrupted. Okay, if any of you have advice for me, you can give it to me later. <laughs> okay, but I want to talk about, uh, I have, um, I framed this idea of getting future ready uh, in this way, okay? I think that there are two ways to get future ready. The first way, I call it outside in, we can get future ready from the outside in, and the second way we can get future ready from the inside out. Okay, and I'll elaborate on them. So let me first talk about outside in. Okay, so we all want to know what the future will be like. And uh, last year, last year the, uh, the Straits Times organized a forum on the future economy and we asked the Education Minister, Ong Yi Kang, he's the Education Minister for Skills and Higher Education, to be our guest of honour. And he gave a very interesting speech. He talked about the economy. He also tried to give a sense of, you know, there will be jobs. And where are these jobs going to be? So, for example, he said, like, 30,000 IT professionals will be needed, 3,000 more PMETs in precision engineering, we need 1,000 more real engineers, um, we need 4,000 more childhood educators in the coming years. And then uh, Gan Kim Yong also said, you know, we need 30,000 more healthcare workers to add to today's 70,000 because of the aging society. So is getting future ready about fitting ourselves to these job projections? I mean, is it about like trying to follow where the government is saying where the jobs will be and, and trying to fit yourself to that. Okay, so I think, I think my own view is that it's useful, it's suddenly useful to know the government's projections on where the jobs will be, but I would say that that is too limited a way to think about getting future ready. Okay, and, uh, and, and this, this is why. So at another Straits Times event, uh, which was held this year, earlier this year, just round the corner at the Singapore Management University, we had a panelist from Google, and she said, don't second guess what the future will be and try to work backwards. Think instead of what more you can learn, what more you can be, and if we are talking about lifelong learning, then do you enjoy what you are learning? So I was very struck by that. I was very struck by don't second guess and work backwards. And why, why not? I mean, why shouldn't we try to second guess what the future will be like? It's a, isn't it a quick and dirty way to get ready for the future, like spotting questions that are coming out in the exam? I mean, I, I used to do that, and I, it didn't work very well for my history O-levels, unfortunately. <laughs> but, um, yeah, because uh, one, one reason is what happened to me, uh, because you, you can't always predict the exam questions. 
And I would say that same for the future. It's not always possible to predict job numbers. Okay? So here's, the, here's a picture of a bunch of lawyers to illustrate the, the sentence below, which was the front page headline of the Sunday Times uh, in 2014 August. And it says, Singapore is facing a glut of lawyers. Okay, and uh, I, I don't know about you, but you know, when I, I, when I was young and going to, thinking about going to university, like law was like, oh, okay, you know, you should certainly think about law if, you, if you're smart enough, lah, because you know, you'll be, you have a lot of status, you have a good job, you earn a lot of money. And uh, I, I think that we would never have imagined this situation that uh, we're having a glut of lawyers and the law minister having to warn that you know, we may soon have more lawyers than jobs for them all, and he, he felt necessary to urge law students to temper their career and salary expectations, and maybe even consider other jobs. Okay, and then, uh, okay, Wayan will have to correct me if I'm wrong, but then it, it sounds to me as if we'll also reach uh, something of a saturation point with teachers. I mean, like, MOE is not really hiring teachers, anymore and um, and you know this this whole idea of like merging schools and all that I, I think that if you had asked me I, I, I could never have predicted it it's, it's come as a big surprise right so so what this tells me is that um, <clears throat> circumstances change sometimes circumstances change more than we anticipate and more than the government anticipates and then adjustments are needed so you might want to keep that in mind if our approach is like getting future ready from the outside in, you know, taking in all this data, what, are, what you think the experts are telling you and what your parents are telling you. Okay, just, just keep that in mind that some of these ideas might be wrong or they, they might become out of date by the time you enter the workforce. Okay, so... And also, also, I want to say that there's no one-size-fits-all solution because, I mean, I wouldn't advise like, oh, Hong Yikang says 1,000 more real engineers, so maybe I should just try to be a real engineer. But, <laughs> I mean, not all of us are made that way, right? And not all of us are made to work with like very young children or very old people either. So, wh what should we do? Okay, um, I want to share with you uh, an insight from somebody who, who has worked in Silicon Valley uh, for many, many years of his life uh, because I think he frames the changes that have taken place over the decades quite well. So uh, this, this Silicon Valley veteran that I'm talking about is this man. Um, I, I've never heard of him until recently. I was introduced to him uh, by a professor from SMU. I mean, introduced to his writing, actually. So this man, John Seeley Brown, he was the ch former chief scientist at Xerox. I don't know how many of you remember Xerox. It's the, you know, it's one of those companies that became so famous that it's a verb, right? Like Google. So like, oh, can you Xerox this for me? And yeah, so it's like a photocopier machine. And, but then the thing about Xerox was that it was such an innovative company in its time that it set up what was called the Palo what is still today called Palo Alto Research Center. And John Seeley Brown was the director of the Palo Alto Research Center as well. So I didn't know that such a center existed until I spent some time in Palo Alto a few years ago, and I realized that you know this at one time was really the hub of innovation in the early years of, the, of Silicon Valley, before there was uh, Google or Apple or Facebook, and before even Microsoft. And then what did the people at Park, Palo Alto Research Center, invent? This place where this man worked, they invented spell check, the personal computer, the graphical user interface and icons that Apple later commercialized, laser printers. Okay, all this they invented. Um, and John C.D. Brown, uh, is my father's age, <laughs> 77 years old today, uh, this year. So, so a few years ago in a speech that he gave to fresh graduates, he talked about how the world has changed 
And he said for my parents, his parents, which would be my grandparents' era, so I guess if they were still alive, they'll be like in their 90s. For my parents, he said this typical career trajectory was like a steamship. They set course, fired up the engines, and powered ahead. Useful in the industrial age, but probably not useful today. Okay, so not not steamships anymore, though it's not like this calm seas and steaming on ahead. Then he said, for your parents, so he's addressing young graduates, right, people in their 20s, so young parents, oh, sorry, uh, young parents, um, for your parents today and me, for himself, he said, our career tra trajectory was more like sailboat, more like navigating a sailboat. We set course and uh, hopefully, through skillful tacking and maneuvering, we've played the winds and currents to get where we wanted to go. Blown off course sometimes, sure, but overall, still a well-crafted trajectory. Then for you all, he said, for young people today, you are living... You are living in the white water world. He calls it the white water world. So now, I don't know when you look at this picture whether you feel scared or excited. I hope it's both, I hope it's both. I mean, I like, I like white water rafting, but usually I'm not in a kayak. I'm in like with a dinghy, with, a, with somebody who knows what he's doing. <laughs> so I don't know how I'd do if I was on my own. So what does it mean to live in a white water world? Sorry the words are a bit small, but I'll, I'll, read, I'll read out the key points. So basically he says you must be more like a whitewater kayaker who skillfully reads the currents and disruptions of the context around you. You must interpret the flows, the ripples, the rapids, and understand what they reveal about what lies beneath the surface. To survive in this environment, you need to live in an ongoing conversation with the flow. Okay, then he, then he goes on to ask, what keeps the kayaker afloat? Okay, what keeps the whitewater kayaker afloat? What helps him to roll right when he flips over? It's the way he uses his center of gravity in terms of the line of balance. Okay, and then he goes on to say, this line of balance, what, what, is, what does he see, what does he mean by line of balance? He says line of balance is analogous to authenticity and integrity. And authenticity is just the capacity to know yourself, your core strengths, weaknesses, values, and motivations, and to work from them and for them. Okay. So, based on what he said, I thought it would be useful to ask ourselves some questions. So that also I can have a drink of water. <laughs> um, you know, uh, partly about how, how we are adapting to our environment and whether our lifestyle, does your present lifestyle enable you to understand the flow, the ripples, the rapids, and what lies beneath, beneath the surface? What are you doing to understand your environment and respond to it? Something to think about. And then secondly, you know, are we, are we authentic? Do we have the capacity to know ourselves, our core strengths, our weaknesses, values? Are we able to work from them and for them? So, I mean, from here, I, I want to actually lead on to the main message in my presentation today. Oh, sorry. I, I, this is too early to show this slide. The main message of my presentation is that instead of outside in, I think that a better way to prepare for the future is from the inside out. And what do I mean when I say that we need to get ready from the inside out? Um, <clears throat> so I, I just want to share with you a little bit about my own experience. Um, so when I was in school, when I was in school, I think I suffered from, 
I suffer from being a good student. Because being a good student in the Singapore system, you don't learn to deal with failure much. And um, you also don't have to venture out of your comfort zone very much. Okay, but I was lucky in two ways because of my parents, and my parents are here today. <laughs> so the first way in which I was lucky was that I love to read, and my parents took my brother and I to the library a lot, um, to a Payo library actually. So that's still very special to me. And I, I remember, you know, wandering around the bookshelves, picking up all kinds of books, and reading, reading, reading. So uh, like this, like this boy. I love this picture. Yeah, and. Um, and I, I think books was how I first learned about the big world outside of Singapore and about different countries and cultures, political systems. I remember once I picked up a book about the United Nations and it was pretty boring actually, but I mean, I was excited by the idea that there was such a thing as the United Nations and that people you know, set up these institutions and they believed that it could help bring about peace in the world. Um, and, you know, through the books, I also learned about time travel and space travel and the great diversity of human experience. And, and I really thank, you know, the librarians and everybody who has worked in the National Library over the years for giving me this, this chance to get a great education through books. And it's a great education because first, it was self-directed. As in like, unlike in school, I decided what I wanted to read. And you know when you browse in the library, you know, you go from like one end of the library to the other, you are actually going across disciplines and reading, right? You could start in fiction and then you end in non-fiction and then you read science and you read like arts, humanities and, and I guess, I mean, I was like getting a multidisciplinary education, which is like a buzzword today, before I even knew that the word existed or what it means. Okay. And, and secondly, secondly, quite different from books was that my parents, um, my parents taught me and gave me time to play. So I remember that when I was young, like in primary school, we, we used to go camping on Coney Island. So you all would know like Coney Island, right? It's off Bongo Jetty. And now there's a bridge that connects the mainland to, to uh, Coney Island. But when I was a kid, I don't know, it's like, it seemed like, Coney Island was very far, very far from mainland Singapore. We had to take this boat. And then uh, we, had to we had to carry all these huge jerry cans with fresh water because Coney Island had no toilets and no source of water. And we brought our tents uh, because there's, there's no building there. And then when we got to this island, we had to pitch the tents. And then my father would round up all the kids, which includes my cousins, my brother and me. And then we would like go and pick firewood and <laughs> build a bonfire at night and, and then the, the adults would cook the food at night and they would use these kerosene lamps and kerosene stoves and all that. Yeah, so, so, um, yeah, so I, I, I remember having time outdoors and playing and, and uh, having the sense of adventure. And in 2009 actually, uh, th that's a picture of me with my friend Sharon uh, going on a walk outside in the, in the areas surrounding Stanford University. So in 2009, I, I was very fortunate and I got to spend a year at Stanford University on a journalism fellowship paid for by an American foundation. Um, so it was a non-degree program, so there were no exams. <laughs> and it was a very enlightened sabbatical program for journalists. So at the end of the year, my landlady asked me, What's the most important thing that you learned this year? Then I looked at her and I said, I think I learned to have fun again. Yeah. And then she smiled this huge smile and she said, that's wonderful. Okay, so, and, uh, and, uh, okay, so I've been working for 20 years by the time I went to Stanford and uh, I think I became rather serious and a bit boring and uh, <laughs> Uh, when, when she said that, I felt very affirmed because my landlady, right, is uh, uh, the senior scholar at Stanford's uh, Center for Education Research. So she, she's done pioneering, some pioneering research in education on teacher learning communities, actually. And, and the fact that she thought that I, I spent my year well learning how to have fun, thought, okay, that, that's okay then, you know, it doesn't sound frivolous to an educator. 
Um, and actually, I think more and more you would you would read from the literature, and if you even watch YouTube videos, there's a lot of academics talking about the importance of play. And and one thing that they say about play, okay, so free play where adults don't supervise, right? I mean, that's when children really get a chance to explore, and and it it might you know help them become more creative, or at least they, it, it encourages to learn, them to learn on their own. And then John C.D. Brown said that actually today, because the rate of change is so fast, we don't only need to learn, we need to unlearn a lot of things. And that he believes that play helps you to unlearn things. And I think he's right, because you know when you're playing a game, you know, you have to adjust very fast, right? Oh, doing it this way is not working. And, uh, you know, team, how are we going to play this game better so that, you know, we get one up on the other side and all that, yeah. So the other thing about um, learning to have fun again is that I think what I meant about Stanford was that there was joy in the learning. You know, it restored a sense of joy in the learning. And, I, and it's, it's so vital, right, because um, if you have joy in your learning, it will be sustainable. And then this whole notion of lifelong learning won't be a chore. It'll be exciting. It'll be exciting. Um, <clears throat> so when I think about the last 10 years and uh, about this whole notion of living life from the inside out, I think I would say that my parents' gifts of reading and play uh, have helped make it possible. And I'd also like to say that, um, okay, so living life from the inside out, it's, it's what uh, he, he talked about authenticity. It's, it's actually being able to be true to yourself. But first, you need to understand yourself, right? And I find that understanding yourself can be very hard work. Um, and that I, I think that if, you, if, you just, if I just go to work every day and do what my, job, my boss tells me to do, I don't think that's a very good way of understanding myself. So I have found from my own experience that, yeah, um, doing my job well has helped me to learn very useful skills, I must say, okay? And uh, I've been lucky as a journalist, to, it has helped me to find my voice. So the skills that I've learned how to write, how to ask questions, how to analyze, how to work with colleagues and newsmakers. But I think learning about myself, I did it more through my ECAs outside of work. And one of the things I, that I have, um, that I've found very compelling in the last 10, especially in the last 10 years, is how to help people, how to help people excel in their area of giftedness. I mean, I believe that everyone has gifts, so, but how do we help each of us to excel in our area of giftedness? And I started, this is something that I started doing in, in church, and, but the lesson that I want to draw out from it is not to say that all you guys should go and get involved in your religious organization or, or um, a charity, but to, to, to say that when, you, when I had to start something from nothing, uh, from the ground up, it really helps me learn something about myself. And what happened was that I realized that, okay, yeah, people are interested in learning about their gifts. And, uh, but then I was the only person, okay, so all my friends listening to this CD, right, this American woman teaching us this workshop. But I'm the only person that wants to, to, that thinks, oh, but I want to be able to teach it too. You know, I want to learn how to teach it because it makes a difference. And, and then it's not just listening to the thing. If I know how to teach it, then I can do this, what they did, these one-on-one -on -one interviews with people so that you can go more in-depth into your gifts and all that. And then... So, I mean, I'm the only person, right? And I, I don't think the church was going to pay for this. So I found myself like buying a, you know, the cheapest ticket that I could find and flying to some strange part of the U.S. called Spokane. <laughs> Spokane in the state of Washington. I don't know. I mean, have any of y'all been to Spokane? Oh, are you from Spokane, sir? Okay. Yeah, tell me what you... <laughs> Do you have any words about Spokane? Spokane is a lovely place. When I, I, when I told one of my, my American friends, he was like, you're going to Spokane? Oh, do you like bowling? That's about the only thing I think you can do there. And then, okay, so I flew to, I flew to San Francisco. Then from San Francisco, I had to fly to Seattle. Then from Seattle, it's like one to two hours, I think, to Spokane. 
I, go, I get out of the airport and I, and I go to the taxi stand and then there's this car that, I mean, it looks like a pickup to me, but apparently it's a, it's a cab. Lah. So I get in there and this elderly gentleman, I show him the address and he's like, well, I don't know, I don't know where that is. Are you sure that that's such a place? And then, then okay, lah, he's a very nice man. He drives and drives and then he's like, I don't know. Because, I mean, the road is paved at first and then there are buildings. And then after that, it's not paved anymore. It's a dirt road and there are no more buildings. And he's like, I sure hope you know where you're going. And I'm thinking, I don't know if this is a good idea. Dear. You're like in the middle of nowhere. And uh, okay, so we finally get to the place and it's, it all, it's all fine. But I mean, doing this ECA, right, I guess it was the first time like a, a quiet, like a student in primary school and secondary school is like out of her comfort zone and taking a risk and going to places that she's never been to before and and after coming back to Singapore it's like trying to teach this workshop and of course I was very bad at it at first and then I got better and you know and you just kind of like build it up and you just have to like try and build a team and see who else wants to work with you and all that so um, but it really, it really taught me a lot about myself. It taught me like, like I'm good at certain things. I'm, good at, I'm quite good at teaching, you know, I'm good at content, but I'm very bad at organizing, like organizing an event. Like if I organize this event today, I will forget to lay out the chairs. And it actually happened, I actually, you know, yeah. And then they showed up and they said, well, where are the chairs? And then, yeah. So, uh, but I also learned that, you know, I was really interested in, in teaching and then I, I tried to build on my knowledge and uh, I, I assigned myself reading projects. Okay, so uh, I, I wanted to learn how to be a very good teacher, a better teacher. So I borrowed books from the National Library. And one of the books I borrowed was about this woman, the woman on the right in the big glasses. Okay, I don't know if you, any of you all recognize uh, either of them in this photo. Okay, the violin and the Juilliard is a clue. <laughs> okay, so the, the Japanese girl, the Japanese girl holding the violin, her name is Midori, Midori. And uh, I mean, if, if any of you all listen to classical music, you, you would know she's a very famous violin soloist. And the woman on her right is her teacher, whose name is Dorothy DeLay. And she is a, a legend, you know, in classical music circles for having taught many of the top violinists in the world today. Okay, um, so from the thanks to the National Library, I got to read this book, Teaching Genius, Dorothy DeLay and the Making of a Musician. And uh, it was, it's very inspiring, you know, her whole approach to teaching and how you, she never wants to impose on her students a particular way of playing a piece of music. Uh, she says that if you're going to be repressive like that, you know, you're only going to unlock at most 10% of their potential. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, how does all of that make me more future ready? even if I work in a disrupted industry. So I, I think that, um, so, so this, this is an illustration that my colleague did. Uh, it's his idea of what it means to live life from the inside out. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, all this exploration and finding out about myself, it has given me a sense that I do have career options outside of journalism if I chose to pursue them. And I think it's also, it's also what John Seeley Brown said, it's given me the confidence. It gives me the confidence that, yeah, I can do it. Yeah, so if, if the Straits Times is no longer the place for me, I have the confidence that I can go out there and I can learn what I need to do and I can adapt. And it also tells me what I am interested in doing, you know, what I find compelling. So the kind of work that I want to do gives me a sense of where I might want to move to. So if you want to understand yourself better, you can start by asking yourself, what do you enjoy doing and why? What problems in the world call out to you? I think that's a very big one, you know? What, what are the problems that you find compelling? Because different problems speak to us, each of us differently. And, um, even what work would you be willing to do if you didn't get paid for it? What does that tell you about the kind of career you want to pursue? 
So it's okay, uh, and this, 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 this is where Singaporeans can, can really struggle. It's okay not to know the answers, because this is a long-term process, and of course, at first, you don't know the answers. So you have, to, you have to be patient with yourself and learn to be comfortable with uncertainty. And don't run away from the questions just because you can't answer them at first. And I believe that things will become clearer over time. And uh, you have to keep asking and keep trying things out, okay? So when you find what you love, don't be afraid to pursue it. Uh, and don't be afraid of hard work or failure because you can always start again. Okay. Uh, and, and for the next part of my talk, I want to give credit to my brother because uh, he really helped me with this talk. Unfortunately, he's not able to be here today. And he said that, okay, you want to talk about, you know, understanding yourself and all that. I think that you also need to understand that we are all of us somehow more or less products of the Singapore system. And he sort of he saw, explained to me you know, what he thought are some of the things that I might want to refer to. And um, Okay, so what, what, what might I mean products of, products of the Singapore system? Uh, so in 2006, right, the journalist Farid Zakaria interviewed DPM Tharman Shamugaratnam, then the education minister. And he asked DPM Tharman, he said, um, why is it that uh, Singapore school children rank number one in math and science in tests, in a lot of international tests, PISA, for example, but, but 10 to 20 years later, few of them are world beaters anymore. Okay, and, he, and the way he said it was, Singapore has few truly top-ranked scientists, entrepreneurs, inventors, business as executives, or academics. American kids, by contrast, test much worse in the fourth and eighth grades, but seem to do a lot better later in life and in the real world. Why? And, uh, and DPM Tharman said, we both have meritocracies. Yours is a talent meritocracy. Ours is an exam meritocracy. There are some parts of the intellect that we are not able to test well, like creativity, curiosity, a sense of, ambition, a sense of adventure, ambition. Most of all, America has a culture of learning that challenges conventional wisdom, even if it means challenging authority. These are the areas where Singapore must learn from America. I've, I've always been very struck by that. Exam meritocracy. You know, the learning that, that we want to help us get ready for the future is not the kind of learning that just allows us to ace exams. That's, that's not good enough. I mean, that unfortunately might be the kind of smarts that they find easiest to automate, or the AI you know, finds easiest to, to do as well. So but I would say that in the last 11 years, because that was 11 years ago, we have changed a lot. And I think that we are doing a lot more to encourage creativity, curiosity, and a sense of adventure in our children, teenagers, the young men and women. Some of you are here with us today. But because being part of an exam meritocracy is part of our heritage, it is good to ask ourselves, how has that shaped our approach to learning and how we go about trying to be future ready? So again, you know, what, some questions to ask ourselves, what kind of learner are you? You know, do you, approach, do you approach learning mainly as a means to passing a test or securing a piece of paper such as a degree or professional accreditation? And does that make learning a chore? Does it suppress your curiosity? Does it mean that we forget what we learn once we do pass the test or exam? Secondly, when, when we are in class or at a course, what kind of questions do we ask? Do we ask exam-oriented questions or do we ask questions that are oriented towards solutions? Questions that lead us to new knowledge and new ways of thinking that we can apply in our work to solve problems, get better at what we do and create value. And then finally, is there joy in our learning? Do we want to keep on learning? So because this is what, I mean, I think this is what passion is about. You know, passion is about mastery and skills, okay? And um, so that's why I want to show a picture of this man. So who's this man? 
<laughs> okay, my father says it's Lionel Messi, right? Lionel Messi, right? Okay, so why do I want to show a picture of Lionel Messi and talk about joy of learning and mastery and passion? Because I think that, you know, sometimes we misuse the word passion. Passion is not about just doing stuff that you like like sitting in front of the TV and watching EPL or football, okay? I think passion is more like being on the field and being so in love with the game that you want to master, master the skills, right? And it's really hard work. But I want to say that, you know, it's only the second guy that has a chance to become Lionel Messi you know, acknowledged by many as the best football player in the world today, some say the best football player ever. Uh, if you're just consuming entertainment, whether it's EPL or a video game and all that, that's, that's not passion. I mean, that's not how you're going to master and get ready for the future. Okay, so the other aspect of being part of uh, a product of the Singapore system is is these guys, okay? Because I think that we have a tendency to look to the top for direction and answers, which means these guys, lah, right? Okay, the cabinet. So government says this is where the jobs will be. Oh, minister says we have to cap university graduates at 40% of each cohort. And then we think, oh, because after all the government has the answers, do, we, do I adjust my plans? How do I adjust my plans to fit in with what they say? But, I mean, don't do that, don't do that, because they, they, they don't have the answers for each one of us, and you can't, we can't possibly ex expect them to tailor answers for each one of us. Sure, from the government's perspective, there are reasons why they think they need to cap the, the, the university graduates at 40% of cohort. I'm sure one of it is budgetary, the second of it is that you don't want a whole bunch of unemployed graduates, right? So. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that, oh, because of that, you know, I can't be a graduate or I, I shouldn't aspire to go to university or, or whatnot. I mean, I think it's more like understanding that the big framework, but then from yourself, it's a more personal response. And how, how do we go about, you know, doing that inside out response? Well, I would say that when it comes to learning, we are more in charge than ever before. And, uh, and technology makes it possible. So I wanted to show you this video produced by the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto. It's, it's called Extreme Learners. My name is Milton Chen, and uh, my project is the future of learning and the power of you. This is about placing you, every young person and every adult, center of their own learning ecosystem. Education used to be something that educational institutions did to you. You went through school or college and you took certain courses and had certain teachers. But now with the internet especially and these low cost digital devices, we have ways of young people organizing their own learning according to their own interests and their own passions. Just about any course will be available online so in by the year 2025 from the best instructors. So we will call the question, what is the future of the school? What is the future of the university? And in my project, we're hoping to record the stories of at least 15 different learners of different ages, telling their stories of how in this day and age they've created their own learning ecosystem. They acquired knowledge online. They found mentors uh, in their own communities. Or across the world uh, for their own interests, and they're powering their own learning using what's available through technology, but also through social networks. They're finding communities of learners, peers who are also interested in the same topics. So it's an exciting age for, for teaching and learning. Okay, uh, I have five minutes left, so I'm going to uh, we can discuss more of this later, but I wanted to uh, quote from some people to back up my point, okay? Some, some experts. <laughs> and, and this is uh, an Arno de Meyer, he's the president of SMU, and uh, at a recent forum, he talked about how that 
opportunities in the new economy for people with traditional degrees. So basically, don't all of us rush out and try to do computer coding, okay? And he told a story which I really liked about how he's a con he, of course, he's a big business expert, right? And he consults for companies and he consults for a video gaming startup. And he said, who are the people that they are dying to hire? Literature students, okay? Because people who can write computer code, no shortage of them, but people who can write the stories, the stories, you gotta have a good story to make a computer game that people wanna play. They can't find those people. So, um, so he says, go for what you like to do. You know, do what you like to do, and when you're done, look for the interesting jobs in the new economy. And then this is uh, Sunil Chandra, he's the Google, Vice President for Staffing and Operations, and uh, he talks about what's a good use of the time in university. Discover who you are, what you're excited about. Don't focus on just one thing for three or four years and do stuff. If you're really fascinated by computers, write some code, build an app. If you're excited by cooking, go to cooking classes. If you really want to help others, join a volunteer organization. Because employers are interested in the whole person, not just in your degree. And finally, I want, I want to quote from a, a wonderful piece I thought that, um, that Professor Linda Lim, who is Singaporean, but she has taught, uh, she's been Professor of Strategy at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan for many years, and she co-wrote it with Benjamin Goh, who is a young Singaporean pursuing his master's at Harvard. And, it was a piece called Jobs of the Future Get Set to Create Them for, your, for Yourselves. So they wrote that Singapore is located in a ge geographical region, which is ASEAN, whose economies will grow much faster in the next 50 years than the Americas, Europe, Japan, or China for demographic and catch-up reasons. So that gives us an advantage over more distant competitors in, serving the regional, in servicing the regional market. But to leverage these advantages to ensure good incomes and occupations for Singaporeans will require nothing less than a post-industrial transformation of many of the institutions that served us well in the late industrial age and the mindsets and expectations that go with them. And um, when they say this, post-industrial transformation, what are they talking about? They said, first, we can no longer rely on foreign multinationals, government-linked companies, and other large local enterprises to create jobs and raise wages for us. Instead, we need to create jobs for ourselves through entrepreneurial ventures, self-employment, and yes, alternative work arrangements, many of which can be well-paid. Okay, so I said that the plan was work towards something more positive, right? So, <laughs> so I hope you won't be shocked by this picture. It was taken by my colleague, the executive photojournalist Kwa Chi Siong, and won an award at this year's Asian Media Awards. And it's a, a photo of a home birth. Okay, so I, I wanted to end with this because I think that this photo this picture speaks of family and of the joy of welcoming a child into the world. And what's special is that this birth is taking place in the intimacy of the couple's own home. So we started with a poem that talked about the future as um, time's excuse to frighten us. But I think this, this picture, you know, this picture speaks differently about the future, right? I take inspiration from this photo because because I think it speaks of hope, and I think that, that the future is a place of possibility. And I think that we shouldn't let fear sort of dominate our thinking of the future, because fear is self-fulfilling and paralyzing. And, um, and this, this man says that the future is not some place we are going to, but one we are creating. The paths are not to be found, but made and the activity of making them changes both the maker and the destination. Thank you. Question. Thank you, Ms. Lin. Can I invite you to have